Hi, everybody. Uh, this is an introductory lecture. Uh, this is kind of a break the ice kind of lecture to give you an example of my teaching style and you know how I how I do presentations and so on. So this is not something you'll be tested on. You don't have to take notes on this. This is just a you know a a, a discussion about history itself, what history is, and and so on. Okay. Uh, so I'm going to ask you a couple of questions. The first one is, who likes history? So you, typically in a classroom, I would say most people say that they do. Why, why do they like history? Because it teaches, it teaches us about our past. It, it's interesting. You know, some of the things that have happened, movements, wars, uh, ideologies, religions, and, and, you know, how these start and so on. It's an interesting story. Uh, people also say, well, it's important for us to know it because we can learn from the past, not make the same mistakes again. And that's a, that's a real good answer and one that's popular, uh, although I can tell you that that really happens. You can, there's, there's lots of evidence that claims that, that, that shows that we don't really learn from our, from our past very often at all. We, we seem to be doomed to repeat it. So to, to me, the importance of history is the, the more people know the real true story of what happened, the less likely we will move forward and, and make the same mistakes and, and repeat ourselves and, and make the same, you know, uh, misguided steps again, okay? So um, that's that's typically what people say about, you know, the people that like it, okay? now So what's, so what's the next question? If I ask you how many people like it, the next question is what? How many people hate it? Or maybe hate is too strong of a word. How many people dislike history? And although some people are afraid to say it, one usually two or three raise their hands. And you know, I, I'm not going to judge you about it. And I don't, you know, like I said, I'm not, I'm not grading this. This is just a conversation. But typically, people say, well, you know, I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of boring, right? History is so boring. And and I would repeat, I would say back to you, history repeats itself because nobody listens. Now, I'm not trying to sound like your parents, but. But, you know, the, the problem is, is that people aren't going back far enough. I think that what happens in, in any society, American or any other country in the world, I teach world history also, uh, and I find it everywhere. You know, people tend to not look back further further than their own era or maybe their, their birthday when they, they, when they were born. So they might have a real strong opinion about something that's happening today, and, and not really know what it's even about because I don't go back far enough to find out. Okay, so I think that that's, a, that's an important uh, a aspect here, you know, of, of um, you know, what, what this is about. So, so what, what makes it so boring? Okay, uh, people, people think history is about a bunch of dusty books in an old bookcase. And it's a bunch of, it's a bunch of old, typically white guys, right? White dudes, bald white dudes. And no, I'm not talking about me, so don't don't even go there, okay? But but I mean, do we do we care about these people? And I I'm, I'm trying to you know understand these are important people. That's Winston Churchill on the right, the Prime Minister during World War II of England, uh, very much a a important person in the early uh, half of the 20th century. Martin Van Buren on the left, the president after uh, Andrew Jackson. So um, that's that's a president right there. But I mean, do we really? care i mean does a typical person care to, to dig in deep about what old, old martin's doing typically not okay so before i go on for the people that that hate it okay and I, we're not in a classroom so i'm gonna have to just go by the honor system here but i'm going to ask you to do a a quick a quick exercise okay and this is going to be the only time i'm going to allow you to pull a cell phone out i don't allow cell phones in class although i'm not sure how i'm going to police that so i can't see you know what you're doing but Anyway, um, in this case, pull out your cell phone, and please, while while the rest of us wait, and for the people that like it, just give me a, give us a second here. Well, this will only take a minute. Um, for the people that hate it, please, on your cell phones, please delete all your images and all your videos. <clears throat> so, so go ahead. We'll we'll uh, we'll wait for you to do that. Okay. Da, 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 da. What's the matter? You 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 you're hesitating. I've given you a direct command. Why aren't you responding? I'm kidding. 
Of course, you're not going to delete your videos and images, and please don't because I don't want to get in trouble. Um, the point I'm trying to make is, well, let me ask you this. Why aren't you? Why, why are you hesitating? Because that's that's everything about who you are, right? That's your, your images, your pictures, your videos of all the cool stuff you've done in your life. Uh, you know, we don't want to take that away from you, right? So... Um, but but why why do you want to keep them? And if you showed me or anybody else in the class, you know, pictures of you and your best pals when you were 11, they wouldn't mean anything to me. They, I mean, they might be cute, and I and I gotta be honest, I would love them. But the rest of the class might say, "Ah, this is boring." You, you know, like this is boring. Why? Because this person's history is boring. Why why is your history boring? Because they don't know about it. Maybe if you told them, they go, "Wow, really? You did all that." And, Perhaps so. Maybe that's maybe that's where we're at here. Is your is family history unimportant? No, of course it's very very important. It's your history, but like your family, uh, the history of the United States is similar to your family. It's just a lot bigger, a lot of cool people, a lot of crazy people, a lot of crazy events, a lot of you know really um, you know, joyous and celebratory times. And a lot of kind of ugly and and dark uh, times, you know. It's, it's got a, it's a menagerie of of emotion. Okay, like your family, uh, you know. America has more than its share of quirky aunts and crazy brother in laws, like like your family does. Um, it's just a lot bigger. Okay, so don't don't um, uh, delete your, your images. Okay. I'm just trying to illustrate a point here. Okay. Okay. So what is history? Why study it? People who study history are called historians. That would be me. I have a title. Wow. Historians study causes and effects of historical events. A cause is a reason that something happened. An effect is what happened because of an event. Historians trying to figure out, I'm sorry, historians try to figure out why things happen. They use their understanding to think about how those things make a difference today. And this is where this is where it's very key. This is what most people think. And there's a and there's it's there's a good reason to. Learning about the past helps us understand the present. Makes sense. It helps us decide what to do in the future. That also makes sense. Knowing what what went wrong in the past can help us make better decisions today when we face similar choices. That even makes more sense. And so we've just solved all the world's problems, study history, and we'll know what to do from here on in, here on in. I mean, the truth is that people don't do that. People don't look back far enough. People don't cherish the past. They don't see it as valuable. It's just it's just the old old school way that that we've grown you know uh, grown away from. But that's not true. To to go all the way back to find the genesis of an of an event, an incident, an ideology, a religion. You know, whatever it might be is key to understanding it today. So my purpose as an instructor is to every chance I get to point out to you how an event from the past is having an effect on today. That, that many of the things that we do today and a lot of the problems we have in society today go back way, you know, way far back in history, a couple hundred years, even a hundred years. Uh, so that's kind of um, you know where where I'm going at with this. Okay, so 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 what is history? According to the historian Ian Tyrell, an historian's job is to illuminate the narrative of the human experience in ways that will enrich and inform citizens. Okay, so that 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 sounds kind of that sounds kind of cool. Illuminate to to enlighten to to bring the narrative of the human experience to to people in ways that will enrich and inform them. Being enriched, being informed is kind of nice. But but is history important? Uh, there's been talk about removing history as a subject from the kindergarten through 12th grade curriculum. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, think of it like this. When you came to college, you suddenly have choices that most high schools don't offer you. Classes such as psychology, sociology, anthropology, these are all intro classes to give you a an overall view of what that discipline's about. Okay, many people think that's what history should be. It should be a a, a freshman college choice to fulfill your general education requirements, but not required for K through 12. Okay, that doesn't mean that they're not going to teach them anything. They're going to teach them. You're still going to have to take American government, <clears throat> and why? Because you have to know that there's a president and that there's a free vote. 
and if there's a constitution we have rights there's a bill of rights and all that type of thing those are important things to know but all the rest that they're discussing putting it off until people go to college that that means that people that don't go to college won't really have much of an historical background uh, but they would counter with people that don't go to college typically don't have one now and they've then they study history so maybe they've got a point but anyway what do you think about that do you think that history should be taken off the off the curriculum of, of uh, you know uh, uh, K through 12 uh, students and and be a college course okay uh, okay so um, the state of the state of Kentucky, and the state of Texas are both talking about instructing or ordering their their history instructors K through 12. Uh, you're not going to find this much in college because in college the truth is a professor, you know, pretty much has has their the the reign of what they teach. Okay, and many many people go to universities to to you know take classes with a with a person that they that they like or that they want to you know learn from so, so this is K through 12 okay the idea of just teaching the good parts <clears throat> just the good parts so what does that mean well and you know just the parts that make that country look good we're talking about America here are there are there a lot of parts about America that are good of course there are America's a great country you could put together a a long you know, uh, uh, dissertation about the greatness of America. There's no question about it. Democracy, freedom of the people, by the people, for the people. Uh, America has a uniqueness about it in that it it is not afraid to to repair itself. <clears throat> Excuse me, repair itself, tear it down and build it over if we need to. You know, America doesn't always get set in their ways. Okay, that's a very good part of America. Uh, come, come, come from a revolution, a revolution against what was considered to be a tyrannical government, a rising up of the people. You know, it's it's an exciting story. Um, but there's a lot of ugly parts too, and we're going to learn about a lot of them. And you know, I want you to understand as we go through this course that at times you'll feel like. You know, are, are we bashing America? No, that's not at all what, what my point is. My, my purpose is to teach you the truth as I know it, as a person that's been trained in the historical methods on how to learn and how to study and research history. These, these things are out there. They're not, they're not stories that I made up to bash America. That's not at all what, what, what my purpose is. Uh, so what do you think about that? Just the good parts. Should we only know the good parts? And that means we, we walk around in kind of a, kind of you know a fog and a daze that everything's great when perhaps it's not are there people in america today that think that being an american and living in the american society is not so great i think there are watch the news any day of the week okay so <clears throat> getting back to this idea of history I, I can tell you it's much more than just a bunch of old books on a dusty bookcase and all those old dudes looking all cranky there, there's a lot more to it than than that okay the 1960s was a tumultuous uh, time in, in American history, in world history, and a lot of changes took place in that, in that decade. Um, uh, you're looking at what's called the paradigm shift. What does a paradigm shift mean? It means that from that point on, nothing will ever be the same. So from the 60s on, our society changed. Same thing happened after World War II. Whatever happened before the war didn't happen after. Everything changed. Never was the same. What was the 60s about? It was about a, a backlash from the people, typically in those days young people, against the establishment. Uh, not, not being happy with what they were being told and not trusting, learning not to trust. So young people come up with this idea that, that was called the question authority movement. What does that mean? It means that you know, for, for many years being an American, it was it was kind of thought that you just did what the government said. You don't question authority. If the government says jump, then you jump. And a lot of the a lot of the people that fought in World War II, great great men, great women, at that generation is called the greatest generation for a reason. They fought a a horrifying uh, war that <clears throat> was about fascism and and uh, despotism. Uh, fighting Hitler and, and uh, those types of Mussolini, Imperial Japan, imperialistic 
uh, motivated countries that, that wanted to take away people's freedom. So it's a great thing, great generation. But, but they became very nationalistic in doing so. What do I mean by, mean by nationalistic? Patriotic, blindly patriotic. Okay, so whatever that country says, you do. So six, seven years later after World War II, they told you to go fight in Korea. You did. Why are we going to Korea? We're, we're trying to stop the spread of communism. Okay, that's great. They, they went along with that. And the 50s, uh, the 50s era is kind of like that. Then along come the 60s, the, the, the children of these people of the, of the greatest generation grow up and they start looking around saying, wait a minute, you know, we don't see it the same way. We're not sure what's going on. The government seems a little shady to me. Uh, there's a lot of abuse and discrimination and racism going on here. Uh, and you want us to go fight this war. We're not sure what this war is about. It appears to me like no one's winning it. It appears to me like like America has no real strategy to end it. We we are this world power that that fought and and were victorious in World War II. Why can't we just go in there and end it? But it kept on going on and on and on. So young people started to think, it seems to me like this war is simply being fought because war war times make money. Economies boom, jobs increase, people get rich uh, manufacturing war goods. So young people said, maybe this is, um, you know, we don't want to be part of this fight. So instead of just going along with the government, they, they, they protested against it. This created a very wide generation gap between their parents and, and young people, okay? And probably never in the history of America uh, had there been such a wide gap where, where you didn't see eye to eye on nearly everything in those days, okay? So... What, what else is going on? You, ha you have a movement, civil rights movement. African-American people are, are, are tired of being oppressed, tired of being discriminated, tired of not having opportunities. Hispanic people, Asian uh, Americans, uh, uh, the start of the LGBT movements in the 60s. You have uh, women of any color um, being oppressed and discriminated against, okay? All these things kind of happen in the same era, and it changed society. It transformed the consciousness of society into what we have today, okay? So so if you think of the word transparency, what, is, what, is tra what does transparency mean? It means you can see through it, right? People, young people were saying, you know, the government, we don't know what they're doing. So if you look at the government symbolically as a five-story building with no windows, they're in there, but we don't know what they're doing. So how do we know that they're doing what we elected them for? Maybe they're just finding ways to profit and line their pockets. So so the the, uh, the quest for transparency, we, we want more transparency in the government. So so what, what would that symbolically mean take that same five-story building and put windows on it now you can now the people can look in to see what the what their elected officials are doing you can look in and watch them ripping you off i'm just kidding they wouldn't do that so this this is kind of what you what comes out of social history okay in the past uh, history was written uh, in what's called top-down history that, that that means that you're hearing from the top of the pyramid if you look at if you look at society as a pyramid with the very elite wealthy at the top and the officials and the politicians and so on, and then at the bottom is the working class people, who's writing the history? The people at the top. The, the, the victors write their history, right? The, the Native Americans didn't, didn't write the, uh, uh, the history about America that we, that we read in, in elementary school because they, 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 they lost that war, right? We, we heard from the victors, and those victors didn't say – we were awful to these people on the way up. No, they're going to make themselves look good. This is top-down history, history from the top. You're only hearing the good parts. But So social history is about giving the oppressed a voice, okay, hearing their stories. So it's the opposite of top-down history. It's called bottom-up history. So you're hearing histories now, you, you hear about – African American experience in the in the Jim Crow South. You hear about the Asian American experience of being excluded from even being being able to come here at all. You you, you hear from the Hispanic point of view and women and and, and you know uh, gay uh, people and and their story. You start hearing these right. So it changed. Okay, this is what happened. So so modern historians or social historians 
are interested in getting the story right and lose the romantic, candy-coated, patriotic version. It's just the good parts. We want to hear it all. Not because we're bashing America, because we want to know the truth. It's about the truth. Isn't that what we all want to know is the truth? Uh, <clears throat> so social history seeks to give the people that have been oppressed a voice because they were part of the story too. <clears throat> Another um, uh, kind of a newer uh, uh, movement in history since the 60s is revisionist history. What does that mean? To revise something. Uh, revise means to reconsider and alter something in the light of further evidence. So I, I prefer to say correct it. Now, a lot of people that are against this say, you're just going back in the past and rewriting history, make everybody look bad. No, that's what, what, what would be the point of that? The point is to go back in time and, and, and write history the way it really happened. And if people were, were ugly and mean, then they should be you know, uh, presented that way. If people were heroic and did something out of the, you know, out of the norm of, of their daily routine, they should be, they, they, they should be given consideration, right? Uh, so, you know, if it's not correct, it's not really history, right? It's, so revisionist history is not a bad thing. Let's, let's hear the real story with all the thorns, okay? Modern history is a quest to find the truth. OK, but well, in the state of Kentucky, people in Kentucky are talking about um, ordering their history teachers to, to only teach the good parts, only teach the good parts, the parts that reflect positively on America. Uh, so, again, you know, uh, that's that's, you know, nice. It, it just doesn't really um, tell the true story. Right. You're, you're, you're missing a whole lot. Again, I'm not saying that being patriotic is a bad thing. America is a great country, the world leader, very powerful. You know, personally, I serve in the military. I have an honorable discharge from the Army and the Air Force. So, I, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm an American through and through. There's no question about it. Uh, I'm not here to teach you, you know, a, to be against America. I want you to just know what, what the real story is, good and bad, bad, okay? When I was a kid, early 70s, I was just a teenager, um, very tumultuous time, as I mentioned before, the 60s. Um, and this idea of this generation gap, young people and their parents. And you had a very tumultuous election in 1972. What, what was happening in 1972? The Vietnam War is coming to an end. Uh, the, the counterculture youth movement with drugs and music is, is you know, 180 degrees opposite from their, from their parents. Uh, and you have a lot of strife, and you have you have young people protesting. I'm not going to fight your war. A lot of men went to Canada to escape the draft. Some burnt their draft cards. Just said not going. So you had a lot of protests on campuses, a lot of fires and and violence, and in some cases death. You know, people were killed. Uh, so you have this you have this huge conflict, okay, between these two generations, young people. And really anybody over 30 was the old people in those days, okay? Uh, and the, the response from the um, older crowd, and this is the greatest generation crowd. The, the, this is the crowd that, that, that fought World War II, like I said, and, and you know won this great battle. And they, 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 sh they should be the, called the greatest generation they were. But what came out of this is people began to, those, those people began to think that, that that America is always right and what we should always do what America tells us to do, including go fight a war that you don't want to fight. So when you're telling your kids go fight this war and the kid is saying, no, you have a conflict. And the and the, the response from the old generation was these two slogans right here. And these you would find on, on conservative people's, they were bumper stickers on cars in those days. America right or wrong. And the other one, America, love it or leave it. So what what do these two 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 slogans mean? America, right or wrong? Should you, as an American citizen, support America if you know or feel it's wrong? Is that your duty as a citizen? No matter what, we support America, right or wrong. Is is that a true democracy? Is that is that true freedom? And the other one here is, if you don't love it or leave it. If you don't like it here, then get out. It, you don't like the way it is, then get out. Okay, so how how do both of those how do both of those slogans you know um, 
how's that feel to you? I mean, the truth is the founding fathers, going back to this 18th century, this incredibly gifted group of men, all white men, many, I'd say probably the majority of them were slave owners. Okay, so not necessarily a pretty thing there, but genius men at the right time. The, the right people came together at the right time to create this country, and it's it's resulted in the first democracy, uh, the first country that that uh, cherishes individual rights, freedoms, the Bill of Rights, and so on, the Constitution, and so on. Um, the the founding fathers, if they came into today's time and looked at that and said, America right or wrong, they would be angry. Why? Because this is not at all what they were trying to say or do when they when they built this country. They, they didn't do it to to say, you know, support it no matter what they do. So if you get if you get a tyrant in as president, he takes over and he's saying all these things that we should do, they would say no, fight against that. That's what being an America is. If you don't love it, that's all right. That's that's the point of America. It's not static. It doesn't stay the same. It's constantly evolving. So many people at, at, at many times will not always love it. it. Doesn't mean that you are not patriotic and not a true American. You're just not happy with what you, what you're seeing in the government or whatever it might be. That's the purpose of America. Freedoms. Freedoms not freedom isn't easy because it means that you have to watch somebody. Uh, present themselves or express themselves, I should say, in a way that you don't like. But as long as they're not breaking the law, <clears throat> they're allowed to in America, okay? <clears throat> Let's look at a quote from the um, from the Declaration of Independence from these founding fathers, okay? Whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundations on such principles and organizing its powers in such form. So, I'm sorry, as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. When a long train of abuses and usurpations, pursuing invariably the same object, evinces a design to reduce them under absolute despotism, it is their right, it is their duty to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Wow, that, that's a that's a mouthful there. And this is in the very opening uh, paragraphs of the Declaration of Independence. This was sent to King George III. This is how we feel, and this is how Amer what America was based on. If you don't like it, don't get out. Get busy. Do what you can to change it. Start a grassroots movement. Perhaps there's more people like you that have the same thoughts, and if you can gain. You know, organization and strength, maybe you can change things the way that you want them to be. That's part of being American. Not everyone's going to agree with you, but that's what freedom's about, okay? So the right of the people to alter or to abolish it. It's the right, their duty to throw off such government to, and to provide new guards for their future security. That That is radical. That is very, very radical. This is what this is where this country came from. It came from revolution. These people started a revolution and they and they won. Okay, so understand that that's what America is about. Okay, so when you go back to America, right or wrong, like I said, the, uh, the founding fathers would be very angry and would argue vehemently against anybody that said this. Anybody that thought that they had the the, they, they have it all figured out. You don't like it, get out. No, you are you are absolutely wrong, okay? A, a word that you'll hear a lot in history, uh, in any anybody's history, is the word ethnocentrism. So what does that mean, ethnocentrism? <clears throat> the emotional attitude that one's own race, nation, or culture is superior to all others, okay? So... Um, this is, you know, superior. You, you, the, the way that you think, the way that your your country, your race, your culture, you're better than everybody. Okay, the Webster definition: having or based on the idea that your own group or culture is better or more important than others. Okay, this is again, this is what you'll find in any history. It's it's very human nature to. To feel that that your your society, your culture, your country is the best, and of course Americans feel that they are the best. Uh, so again, let's just go back to this this uh, disclaimer. I, I want to make sure you understand. I, I want to be very clear that this class is not designed to bash America, although it may seem like it at times. 
uh, the point I'm trying to make is don't forget it is your right and perhaps your duty to challenge America if it is not living up to its core values. Uh, so what do I mean by core values? Uh, freedom of speech, freedom of religion, freedom of business, any others. Uh, they're, they're, you know, they're the Bill of Rights, the first ten amendments of the Constitution is all about individual rights. And these, you know, coupled with other lots of evidence to speak volumes of, of America's greatness. Okay, you can you can start your own business in this country and nobody will stop you. You don't have to go to business school. So is 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 the sky truly the limit in this country? Is that a true statement? The sky is the limit in America. The the opportunities are abundant. Is that is that true? Is it true that all all it takes is hard work? How hard do you want to work? If you work hard in America, uh, y it'll pay off. I, I can tell you my own my own personal experience. Um, I started a business when I was very young. Had not a clue what I was doing. Had no concept at all what I was doing. I just went out there and thought, you know, I had confidence, perhaps a little arrogant, perhaps. Um, and I, I, I made some flyers, and I went door to door and handed out flyers, thinking that maybe they'll call me, I'll come and, and make some money, and 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 it worked. You know, I, I my business took off, and I ended up doing very very well to the point where I sold it many years later for for a fair amount of money. Uh, so sky's the limit for me. I took advantage of it. I worked. Trust me, I worked very hard. Is is that the American way? Well. Um, it really depends on a couple of things. Does anybody have that ability to, to do what I did? I mean, we'd like to think so, but does anybody really have that ability? It really truly comes down to your access to opportunity. Success in America depends on your access to opportunity. So what do I mean by access? It means that, that you have to have a way to take advantage of it. Now, where I grew up, um, it was a small town, and it was a... In those days, uh, 60s, 70s, uh, a very closed society it was white people, okay? Um, Hispanic people and black people were, were kept out of that city. Uh, the, the police would patrol and stop them from coming in. There was wording in, the, in any kind of mortgage buying a house that it was for white people only. These, this is called deed of covenant. So the town I grew up in was a deed of covenant town. So if a if a black person with the same uh, you know ability that I had even even had even someone that had ten times that ability if he had gone door to door peddling the same wares that I was with much more skill nobody would have bought it Hispanic person nobody would have bought it why because they're not going to do business with with a person who's not white so. There's a there's a, 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 a kind of a modern example that goes back uh, to the 80s, I guess. Um, but this is an experience that, 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 that I saw. Those people didn't get the access. So in, a, so in a country that claims that all men are created equal, that's a huge core value. There's much evidence historically to the contrary. The truth is that don't misunderstand me here. A government for white people. Don't, don't misunderstand this this idea of white supremacy as skinheads and neo Nazis. I don't I don't mean that. I'm not talking extremism here. I'm talking about the general society. You know, the truth is, when America started, it was a white society. There wasn't anybody of color in it. Why? Because the Native Americans had been pushed out by the time the Constitution was being written in the in the Northeast. There wasn't a huge threat from Native Americans anymore. They they had been pushed out and and uh, many had many had died from disease okay what about African Americans well they were enslaved they, they were slaves in the south and early on in the north too slavery did, didn't just happen in the south it was in the north also uh, so so America from its beginning was built and designed to be an advantage to white people because that's who was there but also a disadvantage to people of color. They didn't want them coming in. Now, Hispanic people, this early in America's history, weren't really part of the story yet. As, as, as the Western expansion movement goes across and the, the, the continent goes west, that's when Hispanic people will come in. And then they'll, they'll run into the same problem, okay? 
It's all about access to opportunity, okay? So in a country that claims all men are created equal, not, not, not really, okay? So it really began as a white country with these wonderful values. <clears throat> but as people of color began to enter the general society, so how'd that happen? Well, the Civil War happened and African American people were freed. They became citizens. They, they had the ability to vote. Uh, the Mexican American War, the, the Texas Revolution, uh, these, those are, those are two, uh, two subjects, subjects that we won't talk about in this class, but this is where Hispanic people enter the, enter the, uh, general society. So all of a sudden you have a, you have a country that had been formerly all white people, mostly white men, the government, it was all white men. Now you have people of color coming in and, and, and so suddenly race became an issue all of a sudden, whoa, who are these people? And there really truly has been conflicts ever since, right? Uh, I and mean, we see them every day. We just watch, watch TV, watch the internet, any, any you know, uh, media outlet. Every day you can find a, a racially inspired conflict, right? So the interpretation of things like all men are created equal take on new definitions. And they're argued about because not everybody feels that way, okay? Uh, so, so again, make, make it clear. It's important to understand that the core values of America are what makes it great. You can't take those core values away. The Constitution, the Bill of Rights, uh, specifically the 13th, 14th, 15th Amendments, the, the, the amendments that came out of the Civil War that freed African Americans to give them the vote and citizenship. These are wonderful moments, okay? Uh, those are what makes it great. But, but many times, and we'll talk a lot about this, the people who are in power often manipulate them for their own games. There's many, many people are corrupt. Power, there's, a, there's an idea that power creates corruption, perhaps. And typically, who have been the people in power in America? Well, most of its history, it's been white men, right? And this is a very important statement that I'm going to make right here. So, so hear this. This, this is what happened. As the United States progressed, it became about the inability of white men to give up power and control to people of color that were not like them. That's a pretty profound statement. Let me say it again. As the United States progressed... It became about the inability of white men to give up power and control to people that were not like them. In other words, not the same color, okay? Okay, um, so again, it's the people and their misinterpretations of America's core value that's the problem, not America itself. Uh, and don't forget, one of its core values is to protest if you don't think it's right. That's why it's important to vote. It's a freedom afforded to you. Uh, the general American public can vote people out of office if they're not happy with them. And we have things called impeachments and recall and referendum. These are all, you know, uh, democratic vehicles to, to help a potentially oppressed society get rid of any oppressive ruler because that's not what America is about. A, a president or whoever is not supposed to have that kind of power and tyranny is definitely not part of the American um, vocabulary, okay? Okay, so where did these words come from? All these truths to be self-evident, all men are created equal. So I can hear you from here, right? I can hear you all yelling, Thomas Jefferson, the Declaration of Independence. That's right. That's, that's exactly right. All men are created equal. Now, let me ask you, are there some examples of people not being treated equally in the United States history? Some examples of groups that have not been treated equally. Well, I mean, the, the glaring one in its, in its history, not so much today, but in its history, is slavery, right? 1619 to 1865, it was, it was legal to enslave people in America. Now, you're going to learn this class that it didn't end at the end of the Civil War, their oppression and their enslavement, it didn't end until 1965, okay? And that's what the Reconstruction era uh, creates that we'll talk about as our first era in this class. But but just understand that 1865 is, is kind of the, the time when people think, yeah, the Civil War ended and everybody was free. Not, not exactly, okay? Not exactly. Uh, so America enslaved people for hundreds of years. At, at one time, if your skin was black, you were a slave, whether you liked it or not, and it was completely legal. Okay, 
But people say, well, okay, like you, you, there you go. You talk about the past. Who cares about the past? Let's focus on the future. What's 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 important is what's going on now. Okay. So how does this, how does this affect our lives today? Well, I mean, it's pretty it's pretty obvious. Do we still have issues regarding race and color and the color of people's skin today? We still do, right? We still do. Why? Other other European countries, we we America came from Europe. You know, America is an extension of the Western European countries. That's that's America's ideology. Why do other European countries? Why do they not have an intense racial situation, but America does? Well, I mean, it's pretty easy to to say. United States is a society that has been based on race since its inception. I have I have the date 1619 there. What's important about that? That's when that's when a, a ship showed up at Jamestown, Virginia, with 1920 slaves, first slaves up ever. Jamestown, the people there were growing tobacco, was taken off. They were becoming, uh, you know, uh, prosperous, and it's a lot of work. Tobacco. Let's get the, let's buy these slaves and let them do the work. We'll make more money. Uh, Okay, so it goes back that far. You, you have, you know, uh, roots of racism because that's what enslavement is, right? You're enslaving people because of the color of their skin, you and and the and your your conception that they're inferior to you. Okay, I don't mean you personally. It goes back 400 years. That's yeah, that's a lot of years. It's almost half a millennium that we've had this issue. So that so our foundation. Is, is America's foundation is on a very, very racist past and discriminatory past. Have we have we figured out a way to end it today? No, because we don't look back far enough to see how it started to fix it, okay? Is there any, any other group? Well, Native Americans. Native Americans lived in, in America for thousands of years before European contact. Uh, but the, as soon as the Europeans came, starts with Columbus, uh, who did not discover America, but he did. He, he's important to history and the fact that he starts this wave of white European people that come. Uh, so if you if you were indigenous to the land or native born to it, you were pushed out and constantly lied to, constantly lied to. Treaties broken, pushed back, promises broken. This goes on for hundreds of years. You, you had your ancestral lands cheated away from you. And, and ultimately, you, you were, were removed completely from your homeland because the, the lands that you were living on were, were um, fertile, rich soil that plantation systems could be built on. So you were removed, okay? So, but, okay, long time ago, why, why is this important today? Well, Native Americans are still fighting for their rights. They're still fighting for their piece of the American pie. Uh, these were the original people that were here, yet they were treated as if they were never here, okay? Uh, what about if you were Hispanic, if you're Mexican? Mexicans lost a large portion of land to America as a result of a manufactured war. Uh, and what am I talking about? This is the Mexican-American War. Um, your homeland was seized from you during a war if you were Hispanic. Uh, what was the purpose of the war? To gain more land for the United States. Plantation owners in the South who owned slaves wanted to expand the cotton industry, which was a you know, huge, a huge part of the early 19th century. This is what what made slavery rise up so 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 quickly. It also is where the abolition uh, abolitionist movement came from. Uh, cotton was a huge thing. And the, the southern plantation owners saw you know, the southeastern states of the United States that we have today as, as prime cotton lands. Let's get that land. So they tried, to, they tried to buy it from Mexico, but Mexico said, come on, this is priceless. You can't put a, <clears throat> you can't put a price on California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, Colorado. You can't put a price on that. It's too, it's too valuable. Uh, so a war was started. <clears throat> Based on a very suspect border dispute as a reason to start it, in a, in a typical case, a border dispute would be something that would, would be negotiated about and, and it would be finalized. But but America saw its chance to start a war with a country that had no they had no that had no chance of standing up to them. Uh, so according to Ulysses S. Grant, the commander of the Union forces in the Civil War, very very prominent uh, American hero. 
18th president of the United States, he claimed the Mexican-American War was a wicked war. And this is a book that was written about this war, and it's called A Wicked War by Amy Greenberg, a very famous um, kind of Western expansionist uh, uh, historian, okay? Uh, and this is uh, a quote from Grant. The Mexican-American War was one of the most unjust ever waged by a stronger against a weaker nation. It was an instance of a republic following the bad example of European monarchies in not considering justice in their desire to acquire additional territory. So um, what do they mean by that? Bad example of European monarchies. You know, Europe is what we what America wanted to get away from. They didn't, they didn't want to they didn't want to live the feudal system, the manners, the kings, the queens. They they wanted a democracy. But here you are, following the bad example of what of what European monarchies always did, not considering justice. This this was a this was a this was a bully move by America. Mexico had not a chance of surviving this war. They were still trying to recover from losing Texas. So America fought this war, and not every, not everybody ag agreed with it at that time, including Abraham Lincoln. The Mexican-American War was immoral, pro slavery and a threat to the nation's Republican values. So what's the result of this war? So America won this war pretty easily. What's the result of it? All that land right there, this is called the Mexican Cession Lands. All that land became the United States, and this is the last piece of the puzzle putting together what we currently know as the United States today, okay? So so this war was started to gain a huge portion of Mexico's land. Okay, so but again, okay, it's a long time ago. Why do we why do we care? Why do we keep on bringing it up? Let it be, let it go. What does this have to do with our lives today? Well, we we hear about illegal aliens all the time, right? Uh, border issues, issues of immigrants, these are huge issues. We have a president that wants to build a huge wall to keep them in, or, or keep them out, I should say. Uh, yet, you know, you, and we see these kind of, you know, perhaps you could you could say pathetic, digging tunnels to the ground, you know, um, coming packed into vans, you know, like sardines, anything to get here. Why, why do they want to get here so bad? Well, it's access to opportunity. I can guarantee you a, a, a Hispanic person that's in poverty that has children and a, and a wife and a husband, whatever, they're not thinking about the rules and the laws and immigration. And, you know, they just want to get here because they'll, they'll live better, okay? That's what America's founded on. And we'll talk a lot about that later on in this class and this whole idea of the Statue of Liberty and the, and the very famous poem that's inscripted on, on that. Uh, so why do these people want to come? Well, opportunity. But, but the truth is that the land that we're living on right here, right now, this, is, this was their ancestors' home. This is, they used to live here. They're from here. They're, they're, they're from here more than a, a, a white person is, okay? <clears throat> this land used to be Mexico. It's their homeland. So could you argue that they are neither illegal nor alien? Uh, they're from here, and, and this land was wrested away from them. So I'm going to go back in time to give you an example. Like, why is that important? The, the Crusades, that this is a very, you know, epic, sacred uh, journeys and battles that were done way, way back, 1095 to 1289. So the 11th, 12th, 13th centuries, way back you know, thousand, almost a thousand years ago. What what was the Crusades about? These were these were medieval of the Middle Ages, I guess. Military expeditions, a series of expeditions. You can, what this map is about, uh, made by Europeans to recover the Holy Land. You see the you see the Holy Land over here, and on the on the on the I'm circling it right now on the on the right side. Uh, they come from Europe to fight the Muslims to get this land back. They felt it was their land. But the Muslims felt it was their lands too. Now this this argument is still going on and may may go on for forever. Who knows? The point I'm trying to make here is fighting to regain your ancestral homeland is big in history. What's this? What's the movie uh, Braveheart about? It's about Scottish people fighting the oppression uh, uh, put on them by the English that were trying to get their land. We're, we're going to fight to the to the bitter end to get to to keep our land. So. 
what's this have to do with the illegal aliens? Well, you know, perhaps it goes back too far, but but uh, next time you you read about or you you see a, a video clip on the news or on the internet, you know, of, of Hispanic people being caught trying to get in this country, getting getting caught crossing the border, perhaps you'll be more sympathetic about that when you realize this is where they're from. This is where they're from. This is their ancestral homelands. That's big in history. That's, that's Are they trying to do that? I don't think they're trying to start a revolution and fight to get it back. They want opportunity, but but the point is that this this used to be their land. So whether does that mean you, that that America should give it back to them? Probably not. But sympathy, you know, sympathy, is a huge word, and change and understanding starts with that word. Being sympathetic to people instead of always opinionated and 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 bullying. Okay. Okay. What about if you're Chinese? <clears throat> 1882, the Chinese Exclusion Act was passed and excluded all Chinese from any of the country. All of them. You, just, you simply can't come to America now, 1882. <clears throat> now, this is interesting because they had been a very valuable labor force during the building of the Transcontinental Railroad. That, that's a huge event in American history, linked the east to the west and gave people a, a transportation corridor to move west. Otherwise, you had to walk and covered wagons, and you, that, that takes a long time. Now you got a railroad linked east to west. Huge moment in American history. Who who were the people that that were lighting the fuses to the dynamite to, to, to blast through a, a mountain? It was Chinese men. They were called coolies, a very racist, derogatory term. Why were they doing them? Nobody else wanted that job. They they took the job because they, they needed the money and they're willing to work hard. So they would be the ones that went in the tunnel, light the fuse. Many times those fuses would go up quickly and they were blown up too. It happened a lot. Also a valuable force in the California Gold Rush, same type of thing, doing all the dirty work. The California Gold Rush made America wealthy uh, right before uh, the uh, Civil War. Uh, you know, so these are two very important events in American history that, that the Chinese laborers were part of. But once they were done, they were excluded. Um, well, is there any further evidence of discrimination against Asian people? Japanese internment during World War II. <coughs> Excuse me. I'm losing my voice here. World War II and the war against Japan. Japan uh, attacked Pearl Harbor. That's that's Hawaii, right? Uh, so we're on the West Coast here. We know that that isn't that far away. If Japan was able to, to cross the Pacific Ocean and attack Hawaii, perhaps their next step is going to be to attack San Diego or Los Angeles or San Francisco or, or wherever, uh, Seattle. Um, so the government overreacted. The President Roosevelt overreacted, and they decided to inter, intern all Japanese people on the West Coast, California, Oregon, Washington. They were all gathered up and put into camps. They were just told, drop drop your things, get in this truck, you're going to camp. And they were interned for many years. Many lost their homes, their valuables, and so on. When the, If you were a Japanese family, most were farmers. If you were a, a family and you left and your house is open with all your stuff, what do you think happened to it? People came in and looted it, right? So when you came back, it was all gone. Okay, they lost everything. Uh, so who, who else was America fighting in World War II? Go ahead, I'm listening. Oh, I'm sorry. I keep on waiting to hear something. I don't hear you. you yell a little louder. Okay, Germans and Italians, right? Germany and Italy, Germany, Italy were were allies. Hitler, Mussolini. What color are they? They're white people. There's lots of. German Americans, Italian Americans in America at that time, but nobody rounded them up. Nobody put them in camps. So why? Why weren't they? Well, people will say, well, this only happened on the West Coast. It was in reaction to Pearl Harbor. Most of the population was on the East Coast, and that didn't happen there. Well, perhaps, but the truth is no, nobody nobody rounded them up. So is it a racist? It, it was, was it... Was it dumb because they're because they don't look like an ideal American? Do do are, are Asian people at that time they weren't considered to be the ideal American? They look different. They they have different features. So we we round them up, put them in in a in a prison like okay. Uh, you know these people were considered to be foreign, non-American. Although most were American citizens. Um, 
uh, but but they're foreign and they did not live up to the white ideal. So what, is it, what does this have to do with our lives today? Well, today, based on our current events, the the, the era of terrorism, what do we look, what do we think when we see a person that looks like that? Again, you're racially profiling. That's what happened with the Japanese in World War II. They were racially profiled. If you were Japanese, you were a, you know, an enemy. You were a foreign enemy of of danger. Truth is, out of out of that entire uh, internment process, the president didn't find one person that was a spy or conspiring against America. They just were round up because what they look like. We're doing the same thing today, aren't we? I mean, you, we, we see a person like this, and, and a tip, especially white people, we think, oh my God, it's terrorists. And this man's got a shirt on this. I'm not a terrorist. I'm just a person. You know, um, uh, so people of Middle Eastern descent are experiencing discrimination based on being profiled as a terrorist because of what they look like, just as the Japanese did, right? Who's this person? The person in the orange there in the middle. Who's that? Anyone know who that is? This is Timothy McVeigh. Well, who's, he's a terrorist. This is a terrorist. This is a person that was very anti-America. It's a long story, but decided that I'm going to um, blow up a, a state building in Oklahoma. So he, he rented a van. He filled it full of explosives, parked it next to the entrance to a state building, and he walked away and detonated it. And, and that's what happened to the building. And all those people that were in those offices died. Tragically, uh, the, um, there was a, a preschool in there, and many of these young young kids died. Now, in 1995, I had a young daughter that was, a, a, you know, a, a year and a half years old or so. So... I remember this very well, very emotional to see a fireman carrying out a little girl like that when I had my own. So, so what am I, where am I going at with this? Well, no, nobody went around and, and rounded up all the people that look like Timothy McVeigh, right? They didn't go, go get a bunch of white guys and throw them in prison or internment camps. They didn't do that, okay? So the point I'm trying to make here, and in, in, I'll wrap this up here, is the truth is race is a huge part of the story of America and one that is constantly at the forefront of issues. But let's not be so so one-sided here. America is the land of the free, no question. Positives about America also. First country to start the experiment of democracy with the Constitution that calls for justice, life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness. A free country with a free vote. Millions of immigrants in the past couple hundred years have come here and dramatically improved their lives. And they would tell you vehemently, I love this country because it gave them a chance. The United States is a world leader and is a benevolent country that seeks to help other countries improve their condition. The United States sends multiple millions of dollars in aid each year to dozens of countries. So no question, America is the shining example for all the world to see. The only point I'm trying to make here is let's get it right. Let's hear the true story as much as it hurt might hurt at times. That way, maybe we really can learn from the past, okay? That's why education is so important. You, you, you'll, you'll learn these things and then go out in your world and spread the world, and, and, and you may change the world all by yourself. Isn't it true that the only way we can move forward is if we are honest about our past? So to wrap it up, going back to social history, what does that do? It seeks to give the people that have been oppressed a voice because they were part of the story too. Modern historians look to find evidence that tells the true story about America. That is the purpose of social history, okay? So back to the start of this, I said America was like your family. Isn't it, isn't it kind of true? Isn't America a lot like your family? There, there are good people and not so good people. There are incidents that you're proud of and some that you're not. So to the people that I, I told to delete your images and your videos and so on, don't don't do that. Uh, that's your history. You should be proud of it, okay? Um, but like you know, there's parts of it that weren't so pretty. The same thing here. America's history is the same way. So that, that's in a nutshell what this class is about. We'll look at America's history, and it's a very interesting story, okay? All right, that's all I got for this for this lecture.